You come, you come. Our movie, so good at the only on the channel 230 and go TV channel 375. 94.8 XFM. Right now. Often friends go with a wedding party during weddings, but at my wedding, my wife will go with the wedding party. My friend will marry me and come home with me. Who knows what God wills? Three lives are bound within one marriage. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Stories of Africa, the latest regional development. Dr. Doctor, how are you? Yes, I'm well, I would like to assume that. Um, uh, Let's uh, start in a minute and um, as uh, our presenter today uh, gets to load um, her presentation on um, online uh, and share her screen. Um, so you're most welcome to this uh, webinar today. I will uh, start with uh, just a few introductions and then uh, to Welcome all of us to this uh, afternoon's uh, session on um, on the day uh, on the on the World um, Lung Health Day uh, as part of the World uh, on the Day of Lung Science. Um, 
I request that we mute our microphones, just like uh, Dr. Nantanda has uh, suggested uh, in the chat box. I also request um, that uh, we have a concern that we do um, our, we ask questions um, at the end, but you can put some questions in the chat box and they will be attended to. Uh, all they will be uh, included in the session at the end of our questions and answers. And without wasting a lot of time, I am um, Kumba Kumba, alias, uh, a pediatrician and senior lecturer at Mbarara uh, University of Science and Technology. I'll be moderating this session this evening. And uh, I'd like to present to you um, Yes, um, there is a ring somewhere in the chat and I'm, I'm not sure what's happening. I can also hear it. I'm not sure where it's coming from. Uh, it started as soon as we uh, got logged on. It may be uh, with a host. We just have to check. Let me um, invite and introduce to you Dr. Helen Kambu-Anyu a senior consultant pediatrician and pulmonologist and allergologist at Mulago National Referral Hospital, an honorary lecturer at Makere University, of Science and, uh, Makere University uh, College of uh, Health Sciences. And also, um, I am proud to uh, report that she is an alumnus of Makere University, the very first uh, student of the university uh, when it started. And she continues to offer services at, um, at uh, Makere University and uh, Mulago National Hospital. She also led the clinical pillar of uh, the COVID um, strategy in the country. And she has uh, seen uh, all sorts of children presenting with a cough. And today she's going to guide us through uh, what we do when you have a child with a cough in front of you. Uh, given that uh, cough is a very common or one of the commonest presenting symptoms and often leads to mismanagement uh, of children, especially with antibiotics where they are not. And today we will leave here aware way of what to do when you have a child with a cough. So we are um, a few minutes behind schedule without wasting a lot of time. I would like to uh, thank you for attending and joining in. But uh, yeah, let's uh, be attentive. Uh, raise your hand when the time for the action comes. You can uh, throw things in the chat. And then, um, yes, since we can't uh, loudly upload and uh, clap and welcome uh, Dr. Helen, let me receive her on your behalf and present her to you to start her, her presentation today. Dr. Anya, you're most welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumba. Kumba. Thank you. Uh, the others can mute and let's uh, give attention to Dr. Anyu as she presents. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your kind introduction. And uh, I am happy for this opportunity to share again something that relates to children, a common symptom that is bothersome. Um, yes. As I start this presentation, I would like to acknowledge the contribution contributors to, to this slide set. Sorry, my slides are not moving. Okay, let me just stop and start again. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have uh, about 165 people in attendance. And um, I will come you all once again as uh, Dr. Anyu uh, reloads her slides. And um, the admin, uh, please remove that uh, ringing sound that continues uh, to go on. Uh, you can link with uh, Dr. Nerima. Carol, he's online. She knows how to. 
So yes, Dr. Carol Nerima, someone may call you to help her uh, remove that ringing sound in the background. Please be of help. Okay. Yes, uh, we can see your slides, Dr. Anyu, please go ahead. Okay, I was saying yeah, I would like to, yes, uh, to acknowledge the contributions from colleagues for this presentation. Uh, Dr. Marco Zampoli was my supervisor. Mm -hmm. Increase your volume. You know, I speak up. Hello. During my fellowship training, Dr. Rebecca Nantanda, whom you all know and works with me. I speak up. And you. Professor Bruce Kirenga. I go from the presentation he made previously. So this may sound obvious, but I will just go through it that a cough cough is a physiological response to airway irritation. The irritation can be physical or chemical. As long as soon as the brain senses that there's something in the airway, the cough comes as a response. It plays a big role in protecting the airway and maintaining the patency of the airway. Um, so the main functions of the cough really are to prevent entry of food and fluids into the lower airways, that is to prevent aspiration, and also to remove anything that may be in the airway that cannot be transported by the mucociliary system, which that means the heavier things can't be moved, can't be moved by the mucociliary system, so a cough would have to come in. It can be voluntary or in response to a stimulus and can be a reflex or non-reflex. In this way, uh, it means you can, even when you feel that you need to cough, you can actually uh, tell yourself not to cough. That is a difference between voluntary and non-reflexive. Now, cough is the most common symptom in children. Um, and if one cannot cough, there can be serious consequences. Like I have just said, it is a response to something in the airway or in the lungs. So if this doesn't happen, for example, if there is a physical a substance which needs to be removed in the airway and one cannot cough, then it can lead to obstruction. And we all can imagine what will happen when the airway is obstructed. So why are we bothered about cough? It has a negative impact on the quality of life of a child because it affects many areas. Children who cough most of the time will not be able to play or interact socially. Those who cough in the night or even just daytime will not be able to sleep because you know children need to take naps sometimes during day. But if there is cough most of the time, they won't be able to sleep. And this can affect their school performance and also feeding. I usually tell mothers that you know, one of the associated complaints with cough is that the child is not eating well. And the explanation is that they have to choose whether to eat and swallow or to breathe. So if there is discomfort with swallowing because of the cough, then they will not eat. So that, that can be one of the reasons why they, they will be reported to have poor appetite, but it's just that they have to choose whether to breathe or to swallow. And of course, it causes a lot of anxiety and stress to the caregivers or parents and the teachers. Teachers, yes, because when the child is in class and they are coughing, it disrupts everyone. And also, uh, because of this discomfort, uh, the caretakers usually want to find a remedy and they will keep moving from one place to one place looking for a remedy and that can result in high 
healthcare costs. And yet, as we will see ahead, sometimes you can't actually do much to stop the cough. It has to run its course. So some of the common causes of cough are what I'm showing in this slide. But for children, we know that most of the cough is due to infection or anatomical abnormalities. This is different from adults who have other confounding factors that usually make them cough. But for children, we know the commonest cause is infection. And then they will also cough if there are any anatomical abnormalities on the structures around the chest, you know, the airway itself, the lungs, the pleura, the diaphragm, and even the stomach. So anything affecting those areas will result in, in a cough. For the pulmonary infections, most of them are viral. Some are bacterial, fungal, and of course we know TB because of where we are. And then we can have other more severe ones like bronchiectasis, can be inflammatory diseases like asthma, pulmonary hypertension, genetic conditions like cystic fibrosis, which in our setting, we think we, may, we, we don't have it, but it, I think it's because we don't diagnose it. And then the extra pulmonary, you can have heart failure resulting in cough and also GIT disorders like gastric reflux. And then if we have a gastroesophageal fistula. So all these structures around the chest can cause, can result in a cough. So when we are assessing cough, we don't just look at the respiratory system. We also have to look at the surrounding areas. So cough can be classified in different ways. There is this classification which puts it in two, three categories. Acute cough, which is that cough less than three weeks subacute three to eight weeks and then chronic cough. But for children really, usually the subacute is not so pronounced because for most of the conditions that cause cough in children, they will tend to be, the three to eight week may be a period of healing. So if it is like we are seeing that patient is improving from three weeks onwards, then we don't count it as a continuing cough. So for some references, especially for children, the cutoff becomes four weeks. That is if the cough has been on and is not showing any sign of uh, going away. But also we can classify cough according to the pattern. There is an acute cough which keeps coming repeatedly. We have said acute cough is that which lasts less than three weeks or up to three weeks. You find patients who get these acute coughs, it runs it cause and after a short time, it comes again. As opposed to the persistent cough, which is really a form of chronic cough that may only wane it, it appears to decrease, but before it disappears completely, it comes up again. So that's, that becomes a persistent cough. It means there are no periods of, there are no cough-free periods. So uh, this diagram is just illustrating what I have said about the, the patterns of cough. The first with small dots, as you see, it comes on, acutely, but it takes time to recover. So the patient may continue coughing for up to four weeks. And this is really the pattern for the usual common viral infections in children. And then we have the recurrent one, this line, which comes like, it's an acute cough, subsides, and then within a few days or a week or so, it comes up again as opposed to the persistent cough, which is non-repeating, re remitting. Sometimes it kind of, uh, it tends to worsen progressively over time. This is just another way to illustrate the recurrent versus persistent cough. The black line is the persistent cough. The blue line is the 
recurrent. Recurrent comes, subsides. A cough-free period comes, subsides like that. So those are the different types of coughs. So for children, we know that most of the coughs are actually viral. And the, this, these coughs can occur as isolated episodes. They can be recurrent or prolonged, and sometimes they become chronic. Of course, when they take more than four weeks to resolve, when that episode takes more than four weeks to resolve. And yes, a cough, that viral cough can actually, it takes time. It takes over three weeks, about three weeks for a child to recover from a cold. And normally children, normal children get uh, multiple episodes of this cold spire. The range is between four to seven, depending on your reference but others give a range of five to eight. So imagine that a child gets eight episodes of this cold in a year, and each episode is taking about three weeks to resolve. That means 24 weeks of the year, the child is actually having symptoms of blocked runny nose and cough. That is quite almost uh, more, than, more than a third of the year they will be symptomatic and that is, can be disturbing. So during a viral illness, this is just what I've said, the duration of the cough can be up to three weeks. When the cough is persistent, then you get mucopurulent secretions, usually after the acute episode. The acute episode is usually about one week and then the remaining two to two weeks or so are like supposed to be a recovery period, but depending on the virus, it can last longer. Usually the, the episode can start with a runny nose and cough. The nose dries up, but the cough will continue. Unfortunately, there is not much you can do in form of treatment to resolve this sooner. You know, uh, what is recommended is really supportive treatment, like uh, replacing the fluids that are lost and giving child enough time to rest and painkillers if needed. So why, why does this viral cough happen like that? It's because there are multiple mechanisms that, that are involved with a virus infection. There are physical things, but there are also chemical things. As you see in this diagram, there is release of cytokines. All these, these are seven mechanisms that are shown on this uh, slide. There is increased sensitivity of the, the receptors and afferent nerve stimulation. The transmitter levels are increased notably substance P, which causes vasodilatation and uh, mucus production. The inflammation itself happens and that comes with mucus production as well. And then you have leukotriene release and the cholinergic stimulation. So all these mechanisms result in increase, increased sensitivity of the cough receptors that are in these areas around the the respiratory system, upper airway, larynx, lower, the esophagus, and these are transmitted through the vagus nerve to the brain stem, which now generates the cough, the cough reflex. So cough is a common symptom, and sometimes uh, one may not seek care but there are situations where the care caretaker may be concerned, especially if there are associated symptoms like vomiting, fever, or difficult breathing. But also when it is taking unusually long, then there are also one six uh, medical attention. Sometimes there is a fear that there may be a serious underlying illness that is causing the cough or maybe because of the discomfort to the child or to the people around, 
who perceive the, the severity as high, that can result in them seeking care. But you know, it's not easy to, to, to measure how severe the cough is for the child who is coughing and for those around them. Sometimes it depends on how much uh, discomfort the, those around feel. Or like I have said, if the episodes, the coughing uh, episodes themselves are frequent and are of high intensity. And of course, if it is disrupting sleep, both for the child and the caretaker, then they are more likely to come for, for care. And then I mentioned this earlier that for school going children, if the, the coughing is disrupting the others in class, then it will be recommended that the child is taken for treatment. So, so when they come, the, the, the main purpose is really to make to exclude any serious or treatable condition or anything underlying. Otherwise, uh, cough relief itself, you know, there are things we use, yes, but sometimes they may not achieve much. But to make, to come to this conclusion of how the cough should be managed or what should be done, one needs to be very observative and also and take an accurate history taking, I mean, an accurate history, and also subsequently do a thorough physical examination. I say uh, observatory because sometimes you make a diagnosis according to how the child is coughing or what other features you see in the child when you examine. I'll give an illustration on, on some of these things. But there are things you need to ask concerning the cough. You need to know the duration. We are, we are talking about acute or subacute and chronic because the duration will determine what the diagnosis is and how you will manage. Then how it started. Cough of sudden onset, especially in younger children who cannot communicate might mean that something happened. Maybe they, they aspirated something, especially if nobody was there when the cough started. And then also other exposures that the child may have come across that could make the cough start. Whether the child is attending daycare or not, you, you know, this, this age group, the preschool or daycare, frequently have these episodes because they are catching common colds from their colleagues. And then for, for example, for the recurrent or the recurrent ones, whether each episode starts with a cold or fever, what kind of cough, whether it is wet, dry, whether it comes in paroxysms, whether it is uh, productive or not, whether it's present, during day only, day and night, or only at night, those kind of things, because you know there are, there are coughs which only happen at night and during day the child is well. And whether it goes away or it remains, persists, and any other obvious triggers or what may help to relieve the cough. So talking about um, how to take a history of, of on cough, and to be observant, these are just illustrations of how what you observe or what you pick will help you make a diagnosis of the kind of what cough the child has. Repetitive cough, maybe, okay, I will say that one last. The second bullet, cough which has been present for less than three months and is spasmodic, disturbs sleep you have to consider pertussis syndrome. Now, if a child stops, starts coughing when they have been feeding, there could be, or every time they feed, that could mean that there is a, a what? There is a, a tracheal esophageal fistula or the child is aspirating the feeds. If it is in the night or early morning, and then, after giving some steroids for a short time, it disappears. That is most likely an atopic cough consistent with asthma. 
Now, the cough which is present since the neonatal period needs you to look at what happened at birth. But it could also mean that there is an underlying condition like primary ciliary dyskinesia. And back to the first bullet, repetitive cough which is absent in sleep is likely a habit cough, a voluntary cough which is not reflex. It means the child has to think about coughing. Those are just illustrations of what you can pick just by taking a proper history and being observant. So I'll go through some guidelines um, uh, from the British Thoracic Society on how we can arrive at a specific diagnosis from history taking. These are guidelines which we can access online, so I may not go through every bit of it, but just for illustration of how we can assess the cough, I will pick a few things. For example, if it is a, an acute cough of the respiratory system, usually an acute upper respiratory infection, you will have symptoms of coryza. That is a runny nose and, and a cough. And a common cold. And depending on how deep, how far down it goes, you will have other symptoms. Now, if it is croup, for example, you know, you get a, a strider, which is associated with barking or croupy cough. Now, these terms only make sense when you have had, when you know what they are. And in this era of uh, technology, sometimes some of these uh, things have been recorded for learning purposes. So one can always go online just to, to learn how uh, Krupikov is. I was just looking, on the, looking for resources and I saw one presentation which says nine different types of coughs in kids. I think when you go online, you can wonder. But uh, be careful because sometimes not everything is uh, scientific. So, and then if you have the respiratory symptoms, you have to look at, consider whether there are features of lower respiratory infection, because now that, that would point towards pneumonia or bronchiolitis or asthma, which would need more specific treatment. And then if there is anything to suggest that maybe the child had a, has inhaled a foreign body. This one usually presents suddenly and it may have been witnessed by somebody present or it may have happened without anyone seeing, but it would require uh, further investigation. Uh, bronchoscopy is indicated. And uh, for any other things that, they, that suggest that the child is reacting to something, then these ones usually occur according to seasonal exposure. Then we look at consider allergic rhinitis or, or cough. Yeah. So this, um, I thought we don't have our local guidelines, but these are applicable. So, and still, like I have said, I don't have to go through every part because you can always get this online but just to emphasize and to guide on what you should do if you think that something is a, a particular condition. Making a diagnosis helps us with treatment. If we don't make a diagnosis, then usually we end up writing everything for everything. So let us try as much as possible to come up with a diagnosis so that we can give treatment according to our impression. So the first box here, an acute respiratory infection, usually coryza, cough, flu, maybe some low grade fever. And if the symptoms are predominantly upper respiratory, there are no features of lower respiratory infection, like you know, fast breathing or chest in drawing, then you know that is just a simple cold. And you do not need to to give much treatment because actually 
we sometimes we do what we, we think may relieve the symptoms, but it has been equated to placebo. So usually it's just reassurance and encouraging the patient to drink a little more. If we think it is more, maybe there is a tracheitis, then you also refer to the specific guidelines. Now, if there are features of lower respiratory tract involvement, like you have uh, tachypnea, uh, uh, symptoms of distress, I mean, signs of distress, so you are thinking of a lower respiratory tract condition, and depending on what you find there, if it is wheezing or additional sounds, you will think of pneumonia or asthma. Of course, usually, asthma does not present with fever is not a typical sign of asthma. So if you have fever, you're thinking of an infection, but you need... So when you think it is an infection, still you refer. I will emphasize the point of making a diagnosis. Please name the diagnosis and then there you treat accordingly. The other, going back up, if you think there is choking from a foreign body, you know that should be done, bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy can come with removal of the object. If it is kind of a seasonal occurrence, and then the other way, if there are, there are abnormalities in the chest or other features which are suggesting a more chronic condition, then we shall also do investigations according to what will be presented ahead. So, indications for a chest X-ray. I think the point here is to say that upper respiratory infections usually do not necessitate chest X-ray. Even for lower respiratory tract infections, it should not be routine that we order for X-rays. Now, the condition has become worse because people are even asking for chest CT scans for respiratory presentations, which are not really, which do not require such extensive imaging. So even if you've made a diagnosis of pneumonia, you know, we x-rays are recommended if you are not sure or if, you, if they are localizing signs or you think there are some complications like maybe an effusion, then you can do red imaging. Or if you think there is an inhaled foreign body, you, this may be recommended. But, but remember, some foreign bodies will not be seen on X-ray. So having a normal X-ray will not rule them out. It goes back to history, which might actually uh, pinpoint the fact that maybe the child was eating some seeds like groundnuts and then suddenly they choked and they started coughing. Now, X-rays really should be done where you think there are complications or a more chronic uh, condition, but not every chronic condition still requires an X-ray. For example, if you think it is asthma, you may not see anything on X-ray. So it's not automatic that you have to do a chest X-ray. So let's be guided and not be very uh, fast to do X-rays. This is chest X-ray. Leave alone going for CT scanning on first presentation, sometimes even without doing a chest X-ray. So we talked about the cough patterns, which may determine they can guide or point to the cause. And then that suggested cause may necessitate certain investigations. So we have said that the most common infections, most common uh, respiratory symptoms, cough and flu are viral. So these ones, they are, they are predisposed to by the patient's conditions. We know very well that crowding is one of the drivers of frequent upper 
airway viral infections. So here you don't need to do any investigations. But now after the viral infections, sometimes you have, we, ha we have what we call post-viral cough. You get a viral infection and the cough takes long to resolve. Even it may just be a cough without any other abnormal features. So sometimes it's because there is a superimposed infection after the viral infection. And uh, common ones really usually are mycoplasma. Still, without any abnormal findings in the chest, you may not need to do a chest X-ray. But also depending on other history, for example, maybe the child has a, a family history of atopy or the, this has been happening repeatedly, then you can move in that line of considering underlying atopy as a, a factor for the prolongation of the cough. Sometimes you have infections like pertussis. These ones, you know, the 100 day cough, the cough is there, it happens in paroxysms. And maybe when you look at the vaccination history, it, the child may not have been vaccinated. So you manage according to, to the likely cause. This one also most times, uh, the chest X-ray may not show anything. And then we have what we call covariant asthma. There are patients who just, they have cough only and they don't wheeze, but the cough is characteristic, you know, happening mainly at night and maybe worsening with some conditions, but they don't wheeze. And they will usually have other supportive features like uh, personal atrophy or a family history of or personal atrophy or family history of maybe asthma or eczema or other allergies. And then all these allergy things, we shall not focus on them today because usually they tend to be more chronic and yeah, recurrent. So that was about uh, acute cough. Now, how about the chronic cough? You also need, it's very important that we actually distinguish when, when the caretaker says the cough is chronic because sometimes they are saying it is chronic when it is actually repeated episodes of the acute cough. So you have to be very intentional in finding out whether actually the child does not have any cough-free periods or they have some short breaks and then they, the cough, the symptoms recur. So what you do also depends on what you have picked from the history and examination. Sometimes you may have done some investigations like uh, ex chest X-ray, or if, if the children are older, like more than five years and spirometry was possible, you may have those results. But if you don't have any of them and the cough is just isolated and the child is generally looking well, then you, you evaluate whether the cough is really a problem or it is a concern without any big problem. If it, is, if it doesn't seem to be a troublesome or to have any underlying issue, then you just reassure and follow up. If uh, there are features which may suggest a cause like asthma and what, you can try some medication. There is room to try medication asthma medication, and uh, if they improve, you treat as that. If they don't, then you might have to, if, you, if they don't improve on the trial of asthma medicine, and it's really a problem, then you can consider other investigations. Now from up there, if you've done some of the investigations or the features, that you have detected uh, like wheezing episodes and other atopy, these boxes on the right side indicate a likely diagnosis. So if there's wheezing and there's other atopy, like the child has eczema or has chronic rhinitis or itchy eyes, then you can think of asthma. If they have this feature of clearing the throat frequently, allergic salute is really disrupting the nose that they do frequently. 
then you think about uh, uh, you think of allergic rhinitis, and then the cough would be because of the postnasal drip, which happens with allergic rhinitis. If the cough is wet or productive, and uh, you consider a persistent infection within the airways, and that can be because of these conditions listed here, they put in uh, cystic fibrosis first, but I is not really a common, I mean, we don't diagnose it, so diagnose it frequently. So it doesn't mean that we, we don't, doesn't mean that we don't have it. Sometimes you have this persistent bacterial bronchitis. Yeah, so that could be the cause. Now, if the child chokes with feeds and then gets a wet or chest cough, then you think of, recurrent aspiration, and that can be from gastroesophageal reflux. If it is a brassy or backing cough, you know, that can be tracheobrachomalacia or airway compression. This just means that the airway is smaller, so it can be from within the airway or from outside. Sometimes there is this bizarre cough. Uh, I have seen it, I can't demonstrate, but uh, there are different types. There is a way children can present sometimes with some types of cough, which are not really cough. And I think that's why they're using this term of bizarre. The, it can be tick-like or honking or whatever, then that is usually psychogenic cough. And this one happens in uh, fairly older children, maybe above, seven years to an older, an adolescence. Now for a dry cough with symptoms of breathlessness, which signify that the lung function is really impaired, you could think of other more chronic conditions, lung disease. And of course, for us in this setting, we know if the patient is coughing, has fever and weight loss and sweating and all that, we think about TB. It is down on this list because it is a British guidelines, but for us, it would be up there. So I, this is just another way of presenting uh, the possible causes of uh, chronic cough. If it is isolated in a healthy child, I've already gone through this, then like we've said, it could be a recurrent viral bronchitis or a post-infectious cough or pertussis, cough variant asthma, post-nasal drip, psychogenic cough, that is habit, or bizarre honking cough, then gastroesophageal reflex. And then on the other side, usually, where there is an underlying abnormality, like you have chronic separative lung disease, like bronchiectasis, in immune deficiencies like HIV or primary immune deficiencies, you can have a chronic cough, then recurrent pulmonary aspiration, foreign body, primary serial dyskinesia, all these, the same things that were in the chart that I have just gone through, presented in a different way. So how do we treat these conditions? I will repeat that you have to label the, the disease, the cough. You have to make a diagnosis in order for you to prescribe appropriate treatment. So if you think it is post-infective, post-viral or pertussis, then you can use antihistamines. If you're thinking of pertussis, then you can add a macrolide. But the, the, the macrolide needs to come early in the course of the disease, usually within the first maybe two to three weeks. After one month, then you may not achieve much. Though now, because of the other effect, depending on which macrolide you choose, you might be wanting to, to benefit from the anti-inflammatory activity as well. If you're thinking of a chronic purulent rhinocytis, then that should have taken more than, symptoms should be more than this. You can use an antibiotic and then 
topical nasal decongestants, which are not routinely for use in children, but yes, you have to be sure of what you are treating to add some of these things. Uh, for persistent bronchitis, they should have started in some way, probably with a fever and that. You may give antibiotics and review. But remember, if there is no improvement, then it means you need to find the underlying cause because whatever infection may have been there after 10 to 14 days of antibiotics won't be there anymore. The atopy, persistent uh, allergic rhinitis or possible asthma, we know how to, to treat those. And then for environmental exposures, like smoking or being in nursery school, we also have to decide the issue is to reduce the exposure. If it is if it is causing the child a lot of uh, discomfort and maybe the episodes are very frequent for a child in nursery school, you may choose to first take them out until they build their immunity first. Mm -hmm. And for the habit cough, this one usually requires counseling and behavioral interventions. I'll just go through some of the, you know, like here people are able to buy anything any medicine over the counter. But I'll just emphasize that for colds, please don't consider antibiotics. The mucolytics, all these cough syrups and whatever, I know for children, they are not, they have not been recommended because of no evidence of their benefit. However, there's, there can be specific uh, components within that may be of benefit. Like you can use antihistamines for chronic rhinitis and topical steroids. These are really specific uh, treatments according to the diagnosis one will have made. It goes back to the point I'm saying that once you have a diagnosis or you have an impression, then you can actually prescribe treatment according to the recommended guidelines. So, Having said all that, I know, like you see me using guidelines from other places because we don't have our own. We still have gaps of understanding the causes of cough in our setting, understanding the different cough phenotypes and their treatment. You know the way the cough presents and how you should treat according to the presentation. And for the, the medicines for children below two years are very limited because there are not enough, there are not many studies that have, have been done for medicines in children of that age group. Now, we also need to find out what we can use to treat problematic acute cough. You know, I said if the child doesn't sleep well, then it affects their other parts of life like sleep and school and eating and all that. Then how effective are over the counter drugs? Most of them of course are not effective, but sometimes maybe we need to confirm what whether what we are doing or what we are using is actually achieving any purpose. Uh, yeah, just these are all trying to say that we need to to confirm or to find what works for cough under the different circumstances. So in summary, I, for managing cough in children, we need to do a careful detailed history, identify the coughing patterns and associated factors, because this will guide us onto the likely diagnosis. And then sometimes you need to evaluate the patient when they are normal, because sometimes you can't get the, 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 the true picture when the patient is coming in an acute episode. So you might have to get some time in between. And then investigations are not indicated mostly. Most times you don't need to do investigations for acute illnesses. But for persistent symptoms, or if there are features of uh, possible underlying illness, then you can and do the 
investigations. Now, the parents, sometimes we are not treating the patient, but treating the parents. So we need to counsel them on what is really necessary, explaining the fact that most of the pops are viral and they do not require medications like antibiotics. And if we have tried a medication and it is not working, then we don't need to keep giving it. So basically, we just need to reassure the parents, reassure and reassure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anyu. Uh, if you can give a hand clap, those who can. We are really uh, grateful and thankful for uh, your presentation that has enlightened us. And I think your last words are very important. Please reassure and reassure. Majority of the coughs don't need antibiotics. Majority of the coughs don't need uh, cough remedies. Um, thank you. Um, also the audience for attending. There is still someone who is uh, in the background uh, in a way, continuing to have a discussion behind the scenes. But uh, let's hope that the rest of us can um, follow the discussion. And I will uh, now ask um, you know, people to raise their hands. Uh, the admin or the, the host is uh, watching. And then I'll be watching as well to make sure that we uh, do not miss any hand up. But um, Dr. Anyu, thank you. There are a number of questions. One is, uh, um, what about herbal cough remedies? Are they effective? And then uh, another question from the chat box is uh, for children who uh, really have not had a lot of exposures to many uh, of these uh, coughs, how long can they uh, be or stay home before returning to school? Is uh, there a possibility that we should be recommending uh, frequent school breaks to reduce these coughs? Um, the other one, I think, is uh, yes, acute cough. Most of us have known uh, that acute cough is a cough that lasts two weeks. You mentioned three weeks. Is, uh, is that uh, what uh, it is? or? Uh, should we be uh, looking at three weeks before we worry for the chronic cough? Um, those are some of the questions so far, but I see hands up and uh, the hands, uh, I will be allowing in hands uh, to come in. Um, I think after you take those questions, let people raise their hands as you take those questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The first one is about herbals in children. Um, I cannot comment uh, because most of the herbs I think we have are not uh, are not uh, scientifically researched. So. That one I cannot comment, but if it has been approved by NDA, then, then maybe, I don't know. I don't know what to say about it. Most of the reports we have from herbal medicines are personal reports of effectiveness, but uh, how would qualify them is really to have scientific evidence, but I think the herbs have their own way of being, uh, can I use the word certified or something like that? Now, yes. Uh, mm. yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, the other one was... Um... Call the acute cough. Yes. Acute cough, according to the guidelines, the, the international standard is cough lasting less than three weeks. And we know it can last a few days, maybe one week or two or up to three. Not every, the duration varies, but we know like a, a cold, a normal cold usually takes like five to seven days. But since I, it sometimes it takes long to recover. And you know also this depends on the patient, how much 
the response their body produces and how long it takes to clear it. So that, that the three weeks, up to three weeks is internationally accepted. But I don't know whether he, that person is asking in terms of like the, when we are looking at diagnosing TB or whatever, but just for coughs, yes, it's below three weeks. Then the one of staying home, I, it's not that I'm recommending that children should stay home, but yes, depending on how much disturbance the episodes are causing or how frequent they are. Especially, you know, like the issue of taking children to nursery or daycare, it is an exposure. We have said it's normal for a child to have up to eight episodes in one year. But if you're having like two episodes every month, and depending on how severe they are, you would consider that maybe you need to remove the exposure to allow the body to to develop, you know, like children are still developing. They're There's a little break uh, on your end, Dr. Anu. I am sure uh, uh, whether it's a network interruption, but uh, I think the answer there was already given. Uh, Joyce Naroga, you have your hand up. Can I ask you a question? Thank you, Dr. Kumba Kumba and uh, Dr. Anu. I have uh, two questions in one. I come across so many children being uh, treated for chronic cough. Is that a rather allergic, allergic cough, chronic allergic cough? Is that right? Uh, most of these children, when you take history, I guess they would fall in the cough variant asthma, but uh, they are treated as chronic allergic cough and they are indefinitely on antihistamines, Montelukast for months on end. I would just want uh, Dr. Anu's uh, comment on that. And then um, apart from being on Monte Lucas indefinitely for this category that I've talked about that is treated as allergic coughing quotes, there are also those that have been diagnosed uh, to have asthma, mild intermittent and uh, mild persistent, but they are also ambulating on uh, Monte Lucas for months on end and uh, usually without symptom control, uh, I, I will just request Dr. Anu to just throw some light to help us the clinicians on how to go about these children. Thank you. We'll take both questions quickly, and then uh, there are some questions will come from the chat. Okay. So. So I think I went off uh, briefly, but I have had the two from Joyce. Cough variant asthma. Now, if the diagnosis is asthma, we have guidelines for managing asthma. And when we treat, when we give medication, we give it for a period until the patient's symptoms are controlled and then we stop. So if they are on Montelukast, and the, the symptoms are not clearing, then it means we need to move to the next step of treatment. We have, if you look at the guidelines for asthma management, we have options. We have inhaled steroids. Montelukast is only one of them. We have inhaled steroids and depending on that, child's age, you can actually go beyond just inhaled steroids and bring in uh, long-acting bitter agonies and uh, theophylines in that order, according to how severe the symptoms are and how they are responding to treatment. So if the patient, if the patient's symptoms are controlled, I mean, they are not there for more than three months, then that patient should stop the Montelukast. But if they have been on Montelukast and the symptoms are persisting, they need more than Montelukast. So mild cough variant asthma, 
should still be classified, whether it is mild, whether it is persistent or intermittent. If it is persistent, yes, they go on daily medication. If it is intermittent, we treat when the episodes happen. I hope that, yeah. Okay, I hope that is uh, clear. I think uh, the questions from the chat as I wait for more hands are uh, one, what is the role of home remedies, Jinga uh, and uh, 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 other leaves of eucalyptus and things like that? The next one is, um, how would you manage a cough due to gastroesophageal reflux? Um, and I think in between, uh, someone has already been advised, a child had a cough uh, that was, she calls, you know, she calls bad, and then recurred three weeks, is recurring three weeks after an initial treatment uh, by the pediatrician. And I think someone has responded that the child is being assessed again and uh, treated, but in the light also that uh, we coughs keep uh, recurring in, uh, in these children. Up to eight coughs is normal, that we just had. So two, the, the, the two questions, uh, Dr. Helen, you can take them on. The role of home remedies. Yes. Yes, home remedies, you know, like home remedies are supposed to relieve the symptoms. So for the symptoms that are usually there are really the nasal congestion or runniness and then the cough. Yes, we recommend those home remedies. For example, if you say honey and there's some honey and demon or whatever, it's really to soothe the throat. The inhalation, something to clear the nose, maybe some steam and whatever. Those, yeah, those are home remedies. We can use them. Uh, the, how do you manage cough from reflux? The, the management of cough from reflux is really to, to stop or to reduce the amount of the gastric contents going into the airway. And that one depends on the age of the patient. You can, for I'll give you an illustration. For young babies who are supposed to be taking milk, we usually try to thicken the feeds so that they don't easily come up from the stomach. But also after feeding, the patient should maintain a position which is more towards vertical than lying down. So simply saying, don't make the baby lie down after feeding, soon after feeding is one way, but uh, it depends. If, it, if the reflux, depending on how much aspiration happens, a patient can actually have a chronic lung disease, which will require additional management. Apart from that, just uh, based on the feeds and position. Um, Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. That's uh, very helpful. I hope the people asking questions are getting uh, their answers and uh, are taking uh, the guidance. Um, the other two questions coming in, I don't see hand up, but there's a question on, uh, is there ongoing work on guidelines for our setting? Uh, you presented guidelines from the British Thoracic Society. Uh, some are very, uh, in some are different remarks. One would be good for our setting. Is there an effort to improve guide, make guidelines for our setting? That's one question. The next one is uh, there are many patients coming in uh, having received lots and lots of treatment uh, before they come to health facilities. How can you, or how can one tell if the caretaker uh, is giving you the whole history? Um, all uh, your missing something when you when take the story. I think that's a bit, uh, a bit uh, unusual, but I think those two questions as I pick up the others. Thank you, Dr. Helen. Um, sorry, I'll start from the second one. The issue, how can you tell? No, you have to take the story, the history yourself. So if from your history, you think things are not adding up, then you need to probe more according to what you think might be the, the fact or whatever. What was the first one? Because if 
the issue of saying you feel the caretaker is not giving the whole story, you point out why you think it is not like that. For example, if the caretaker comes and says this child has been coughing for, for five days and maybe the fever started yesterday and you see a wasted child and maybe you see a very sick child, maybe wasted and you want to think about a more chronic condition or, or TB, then you explore according to what you what impression you think you want to drive at. What was the first question? Yeah, the, the first question was on uh, guidelines. Do we have any work? Oh, guidelines, yes. Guidelines. It's a gap that we have seen. And as we were preparing this presentation, we saw that I think we need to take a step and make some guidelines for us and also for yeah, the caretakers. Yeah. Yes, it's something that we need to work on. Okay, thank you. And um, the other one is uh, what's your take on influenza vaccines uh, uh, for recurrent URTIs in preschoolers especially? Should we be giving our children vaccine in the, the, the influenza vaccine uh, repeatedly? What should we do? That's a very trick one. I usually tell people that I don't prescribe the vaccine is recommended people, for people with underlying uh, conditions like immune deficiency or some chronic lung disease, which is not when you don't want to cause more damage. But also, it is for settings where you, where usually the that flu, the influenza infection happens at a certain season. I think it is before winter. So for our setting, I uh, I do not actually practice it. So me, I can't say that I would recommend it because for those who who have interacted with patients who have been receiving the vaccine, what is your experience? Do the children actually stop getting the colds or not? Yeah, good question, and I think the pediatricians and other practitioners on the um, on this in this uh, uh, call can um, give their experiences. Uh, briefly, I'll give uh, maybe a little room at some point. Um, while someone is thinking about that, let's uh, take another question, which is in um, this one. I think is uh, Paul Muliamboga is saying that we are seeing uh, increasing cases of adenotonsillitis among children. They seem to present with allergic acute coughs uh, with histories of difficulty in breathing, parents are struggling, and uh, with night associated uh, associated night sweats, how best can we assist such patients, such parents or patients? Um, yes, that's the uh, question from Paul. Uh, Adenotonsitis and recurrent uh, coughs that would seem to be allergic. What should we be doing for those ones? The next question so, is uh, in GINA guidelines. Um, should we be using our GINA, GINA guidelines for our setting for asthma or should we wait uh, for other guidelines or is there another guidance? Thank you. Those two. Okay. I will just start with that one. Yes. At the moment, that is what we practice. We use GINA guidelines to manage our patients because they are really applicable to a resource limited setting like ours. It gives options which we can practice. The, that's fine. The first question was on adenosynthesis and the current symptoms. Now, adenotonsillitis and recurrent symptoms of recurrent cough. Yes. We have to go back to what we discussed about the differentials of the cough. Acute recurrent or is it uh, persistent? Now, when the, when the person says that, like there are features of a, a allergic something, then it is pointing towards, towards asthma. Now, when you have allergy, different systems are affected. The, yes, the airway starts from the nose down to the chest. You have the eyes, you have the skin and whatever. So if that patient has other supporting features, then you treat the patient of, as a patient with atopy. 
and cough, you also need to really confirm that the cough is actually recurrent and not maybe more of persistent. And you would go to assess to determine whether you need to treat as intermittent or persistent. So that is really that angle of managing as asthma. You have to, to, to determine how much time the patient is spending with symptoms so that you decide whether to give continuous treatment or just manage the episode. And those are that is within now the guidelines, which somebody is asking about the GINA guidelines. But please, I also, I, if you can, if you are in a place where you can refer the patient for initial assessment, it will help the patient. Then the patient comes back to you when the plan is laid down. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, we are coming towards um, a, a point where we will ask just a few people, chefs or uh, practitioners, to share very brief experiences on, uh, uh, on the use of some of the things that uh, Dr. Helen has asked about. But there's a question from uh, um, Joanne, I think, who's asking, uh, what's, uh, is it true that multivitamin supplements should re or reduce the frequency of coughs in children? And then an earlier one was um, uh, uh, the, the other one was, uh, I think, from uh, Harriet. And just try to trace it. Um, for the clinicians using uh, syrups with combinations of abitalin, guanfenesin, and uh, bromhexin, or what they call uh, one of those is brosidex. What is your experience using these cough syrups, which seem to be so common on the market? Um, I think I'll give the first question to uh, you, Dr. Anyu, and then uh, and maybe you can take on the second one as well, or another person with experience on these procedures and other formulations could help. Thank you. Okay, so some time ago, Uh, guidance was brought out by WHO about cough syrups in children. The challenge with the syrups is that they have a lot of components. Though sometimes we, we are actually interested in one of the components. I'll give you my experience, especially when I deal with very small children who have, who have a background of atopy. And I, I want a bronchodilator. I would want, and maybe I am not able to so much do the inhalation therapy, and I want to add a systemic, like a, a syrup or an oral medication. And I, I would, I want, I want a, either salbutamol or brosidex. Salbutamol, of course, has its own effects of. Uh, the side effects, whereby the common one that people see is are the tremors. But for ease of administration, yes, I, I use the cough mixtures which have tabutalin, not much uh, salbutamol because of the side effects. So I was saying the challenge is that they have, usually they have like four components in one mixture which now becomes a problem because you, you may not need the other components of that, of that mixture. And it is still like the other additives maybe sometimes are just to soothe the throat or something like that. Okay. Well, I, I have colleagues here on the chat and anyone is free to come in. I don't know if I've answered what, uh, that was about cough syrups. Very much, you did uh, answer the question of cough syrups. Uh, the next one was, is on spirometry. Maybe I should ask uh, Dr. Rebecca Nantanda, who is, um, also in attendance to give guidance on that, but you take maybe a little uh, drop of water to 
soothe your throat. And then um, I will uh, open that up for some quick experiences before we wind up. Uh, Dr. Thank, you, Chair. thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. And thank you so much, Dr. Helen, for this very important discussion. So, spirometry usually starts uh, at six years going upwards, but I know, and so when they come here, we are able to assess whether they'll be able to do the spirometry tests. And whoever asked for this, uh, asked this question, thank you so much, because many times we receive parents who have been assured they are three months, they are one year, they are two years, and they've been assured that when you go, they are going to do a certain test, which will tell everything about your lungs. So it's only for six years and above, and then we assess them individually to see if they're actually able to comprehend the instructions for spirometry. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope that is clear, six years and above, and uh, also being able to follow instructions. Um, there is a question that is quite pertinent. A recommendation, what's a recommendation on um, management of cough that's associated with sore throat? Uh, this is from uh, uh, Amprira Robata. We are being encouraged to manage uh, these with antibiotics such as azithromycin, especially due to the prevalence of rheumatic heart disease. What do you uh, think uh, since you mentioned uh, that, yes, since you mentioned that we should be observing children as the first option. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anyu, are you back to take this? Yeah, thank you. I am wondering where the guide is coming from for rheumatic heart, I mean, for giving antibiotics because of rheumatic heart disease. Yeah, it does not mention the source, and I don't know a guide that is that uh, specific. So that must be somebody's, uh, someone just decided and is uh, propagating that message. It is not right. Yes, yes, we yes. have said, yes. I mean, if you have listened, yes. A sore throat, that is really the chorizum, and most of it comes with a sore throat. And we've said most of these upper airway infections are viral. If you have to give an antibiotic, then you should have a pointer, something to that may be making you think that there is a bacterial infection on top of it. I am seeing some things on the chat. Somebody talked about zinc and what. Yes, uh, you know, we know zinc and vitamin A are micronutrients that are important in the, in the repair of uh, mucosal linings, especially in the GIT and the respiratory system. Yes. Uh, it, they are. They have been recommended. Some time ago, zinc was recommended for everyone with pneumonia. And then another guide came and was limited to HIV-infected children. And then uh, I think practice shows that... Uh, I mean, the, the, the effect, the role of zinc remains, whether a person is immunosuppressed or not, but also knowing that in our settings, most of our children are deficient. Zinc is a micronutrient, it's a supplement. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, I don't see a problem with giving zinc, especially for children who have had persistent pro, uh, cough, persistent airway symptoms. Because, and these are children who may not be eating well and whatever, so there is no harm. These are supplements, but they are not, yeah, they, are, they would be like supportive treatment. And then someone asked about oral salbutamol. As you know, the recommendation is that we should use inhaled medicines so that, yeah, we need to use inhaled salbutamol as opposed to oral. I have had those experiences from people who have used, especially older children or adults who have used oral salbutamol and the side effects that they get actually make them resolve that they would rather not take any medicine than take salbutamol. I have seen mothers report when they come and they have taken their, their children, babies have been given salbutamol, how the babies have 
tremors or something like that. So the side effects that go with taking this uh, salbutamol orally are the reason why they were, why the route of administration was changed to inhale because then you're using a small dose which only goes to where you need it. It's not recommended, but yeah. Thank you very much for clarifying that because I also see a lot of salbutamol being given orally, but it's also, there's also some salbutamol in a number of formulations. I have seen ascoril and salbutamol patients keep coming in with those side effects. So that's, I think let's uh, take it clear from here that inhaled salbutamol is a preferred route of administration. Um, there's a question here, just wondering if it is true that the more exposures to these common viruses that children uh, get, the stronger their immunity against them. Is uh, that uh, true? I think that's one of the questions there. Um, as you answer that, I should uh, notify that uh, we are about to um, pose the questions, but I will give a few uh, minutes to uh, anyone of those of the patroners out there who has specific ex experience with specific medicines, um, either positive or negative, that we should uh, uh, probably uh, pick up from this discussion. Yes, so thank you. You could take that question, Dr. Anyo, as we conclude. I beg your pardon? The question is, in, uh, is it true that the more exposure to common oh, virus, yeah. okay. the better the immunity? Well, I am not... No, I, 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 that is not really what is known because now we are talking about this stage where the child is exposed. Like in our setting now, hmm? children in urban settings don't have a lot of exposure. So when they go to communities like daycare or nursery, then they start to get these viral infections. But also we know that those who are who are at home and have older siblings, usually the older siblings catch the cold and then they come home and give to the young ones. I don't think it, that it is, uh, it is the exposure that results into a stronger immunity, but that as the child grows older, their body, yes, every time you're exposed, you develop some antibodies too the infection. Unfortunately, we all know that the viral infections keep changing every time. So it's like we've just been in this COVID season. You know, you think you've, uh, you've uh, developed resistance to one and then it changes a bit and then you are still susceptible. So it's not really like that. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, questions continue to come in and I'm picking out those that have not been answered before. I would like to get some insight on how to manage this dry irritating cough that's associated with postassive vomiting that has been very prevalent in this, during this school term. Um, that's one question. Uh, postassive vomiting uh, with a, a dry irritant, irritating cough. The next one is, um, Flu-like symptoms presenting with a moderate to severe neutropenia and lymphocytosis. Is this anything that anyone has experience with? Yeah, thank you. Could take those two. Then, uh... Now, the one of uh, uh, postassive vomiting. Yes. I, you know, usually when we look at, when we see children coughing and vomiting and what, we need to characterize that cough. The commonest uh, association is pertussis. So uh, is that ruled out? Because if it is pertussis, then there is a recommendation for using salbutamol actually for the paroxysms and whatever. You have to make a diagnosis. I think I keep going back to that because you may need to treat the underlying problem. Then the other one of frequent, the corpse with the neutropenia and the like, leukocyte, eh? Leukopenia, no lymphocytosis. That I think that picture is really a viral infection, which which is ex, what is expected. We have said the commonest infections are viral, and certainly viral infections come with a neutropenia and lymphocytosis. 
Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, one last one, I think, to Dr. Rebecca uh, Nanta, and I think you are still around. When do we nebulize with salbitamo and when do we nebulize with normal saline in children under five years of age? Uh, thank you, Chair. It seems like the discussion is moving to wheezing uh, illness. Uh, yes, yes. And maybe we are learning when we need to discuss this at some point. But usually the salbutamol, we do it when we have children with acute exacerbations of asthma. For normal cell line, there is contradicting information whether it is of benefit for children who have bronchiolitis or it is not beneficial at all. So I think we can discuss that at some other point, but yeah, that is the, 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 the guideline. And maybe be, before I sign out, I, my comment on this presentation and from the experience and the request really have for clinicians is to try as much as possible to assess uh, children when they come with cough from the questions that are coming through, it looks like most times we treat the cough, but Dr. Helen has really done a great job to emphasize the issue of assessing and assigning a diagnosis so that you're able to treat. Then the other thing I want to share is, uh, which is a good thing, some clinicians are starting to recognize and identify children who may be having asthma symptoms but there is still a challenge of communicating with the parents, but also giving short-term courses. Somebody talked about Monte Lucas every now and then, and then they don't they get better, and then they, they, they get the cough again. I think it's important if whenever possible to try and follow up with our patients. It's usually better if you have a good communication platform with a patient. But if they come in and you ask, they ask them, do you have cough, it's dry, have your ascoril go home, then they'll go to another clinician at another point. So in this interaction, like just like for other clinical conditions, we need to try and communicate to the parents. We learn a lot from that. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, uh, Dr. Rebecca, before you leave, I think you take that one. I'll take this last one. And, uh, it's uh, what's the role of expectorants and immunopolitic drugs. I think it's already been mentioned and mentioned, but you can make a conclusive statement on this that people go away with a good message. Yes, thank you. I think it was the second or third last slide as Dr. Helen presented. Most of these mucolytics and expectorants actually do not have a role when we are treating children, whether it's acute or chronic cough. And so it's only, you need to, look at the contents of whatever syrup you are looking at. Only mention that if there is history of atope and you're looking for something that is going to work against the atope, maybe you can give, but generally speaking, expectorants, mucolytics for the pediatric population, they do not have any role in actually supporting uh, uh, care. And so again, I emphasize best assess, find out what the cause is and then treat the cough be cognizant of how long the cough is likely to take because many times we want to treat and it goes away in three days, but we've just heard that some coughs take a long time to actually disappear. And so I think it's important to take these discussions you've had on what to expect, what to expect, communicate it to the parent, and then what is good for the child and what is not good for the child. Thank you. Thank you very much for concluding with that. Um, oh, questions just keep coming. I think the, the discussion is quite interesting, but I am. I think we need to be concluding. I know that uh, we have assigned up to five, but um, some questions are recurrent. But there is one new one, and uh, it's um, for six children with sickle cell that are prone to acute, acute chest syndrome and are no longer taking penicillin V. Do we give um, pneumococcal vaccine and, that, and what are the different time points when this can be given? Um, Rebecca, you want to take that or do you want to leave? We hate already. Dr. Helen can take that, but any other pediatrician I think can take that. Recommendations for pneumococcal vaccine. Pneumococcal vaccine yes, sure. yeah. yes. Uh, I think let's get a volunteer pediatrician online. Uh, to take this on. Um...
Do we the, have the people who are working with the sickle cell uh, patients, yes, please. Yes. What are the recommendations for pneumococcal uh, vaccination for children with sickle cell disease? I am trying to look for those in the sickle cell clinics um, online. And I don't see them yet. Um, do we have anyone want to uh, really take that? And I think so. The person is asking about the frequency or at what time points and um, yes, the recommendation. We have someone online. Oh, uh, we can an ID specialist. Yes, so I, I, I should say that uh, it's important that every child with sickle cell disease actually gets uh, pneumococcal vaccine uh, administered. And as early, either you as part of the routine vaccination or as early uh, in the first five years of their life when they are still below five years of age. Um, and uh, once a vaccine is given, a boost, I mean, a next dose should be given uh, three, I mean, four weeks later. Uh, if that is uh, what, uh, what, what you aim is to give a complete series and uh, up to three doses of water in the, in the recommendations, really. Uh, but also that does not stop uh, patients taking or continuing to take their penicillin, their pen V uh, prophylaxis, but a, a, a good uh, completion of the primary series of uh, pneumococcal vaccine is very, very important for all children with asthma. Um, I think we can uh, keep it at that. And uh, I think uh, with no new questions coming in or, uh, and also looking at uh, the, um, the trend of things, I think let's um, plan that we will share the slides um, in the regions, different regions, so that uh, people who coordinate and know the emails of everyone in their region can uh, share them out. Um, maybe eventually UPA will create for us a portal for such slides so that people can go to the portal and uh, download or read the slides. I don't know whether, um, whether the UPA team is in attendance, but that would be a very good thing uh, to have a portal, a knowledge sharing portal where we can have these vaccine, I mean, these are slides shared. Um, as I conclude, I want to say a, again a very um, a big uh, upload and word of thanks to Dr. Helen Anyu, uh, who is also the clinical head of uh, pediatrics at Mulago National Faro Hospital. And um, thank you really very much for clearly and at explaining the real challenges that we face uh, in the communities. I hope that there are many people from the Health Center 4s, Health Center 3s, private clinics who have attended and benefited because that's a lot of uh, where we get uh, challenges uh, with uh, treatment for coughs, but also in the bigger hospitals, we still have challenges uh, managing the coughs. But I think today's uh, discussion has given us a full insight in one guidance in what we should be doing. I want to repeat the words that you mentioned, Dr. Helen. Um, one, label the disease and make a diagnosis. Give the cough a diagnosis before you start treating so that you manage uh, the disease appropriately, not just the cough. And then the second one was mainly that for majority of the patients, what we need is to reassure and reassure, especially the parents, uh, that the cough is only part of the normal routine uh, for eight, uh, up to eight times is actually normal. Um, the others, everyone has listened uh, for themselves. And um, I will uh, probably ask you to give uh, the last word so that uh, we can uh, conclude this uh, discussion. Dr. Helen, welcome to just conclude this, work, uh, this discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad that we had this opportunity to share. And I just encourage uh, the team or those who have attended to share what they picked. But I would like to repeat I would not to, rep to uh, maybe send off the audience with this phrase that not cough is the same. 
So we need to assess this cough. Otherwise, if we continue the way we are doing, then we are not helping the patient. Let the cough be a symptom, which is a presentation Yes, we are losing you. We lost uh, Dr. Helen Anyu. Uh, but uh, we have had her last message, but also disseminate what we have learned so that everyone is doing the right thing as we work out on the guy as we work out guidelines for uh, treatment uh, for management of coughs in this country. I think uh, we'll be updated on how or, or whether that process uh, can uh, start and proceed. Uh, but uh, again, would like to hand it over to uh, UPA to help arrange. Uh, a guidelines development uh, process for managing coughs in this country. But as I said earlier, also to create a knowledge sharing portal for pediatric, I mean, for the uh, pediatric community uh, to share information uh, in this country. That said, I want to thank you very much for being a good audience and for being um, very interactive and asking the questions on the chats and uh, enjoying the discussion. Thank you. Have a blessed evening. Uh, go and treat and manage the coughs appropriately. Thank you. The discussion is ended. A very good evening to all of you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.